Hi, and welcome to Georgia Medical Academy's online EMT program. Once again, I'm Tom Campwain, and we're continuing on with Chapter 1, and we're going to talk about levels of training. And this is pretty much going to be a review for all of you, but it's a required topic that we need to go over. So let's talk about the levels of training and what it means. So we talked about in our last lecture about how licensure is a function of the state's and each state has the ability to determine what an AEMT can and cannot do. The states also have the responsibility to enforce and regulate EMS. With this in mind, this has caused some variations in the levels. And in some states, AEMTs can do some things. In other states, uh, they cannot. Well, here in the state of Georgia, and I'm going to talk uh, mainly about the state of Georgia because that's what I know about, there are, there is a spot where you can go, you can go www.ems.ga.gov, and that will take you to the Department of Public Health site for EMS. And if you see here, right here in the middle of the page, there's a spot that says Scope of Practice. You can click there and that will take you to another page that has all the Scope of Practices, uh, the Scope of Practice documents for providers in the state of Georgia. So you can look at all levels or you can just look at the AEMT, EMT, Paramedic, Cardiac Technician, and EMT Intermediate. Well, we're interested in the AEMT because we're doing AEMT here. And what you have here is the document that tells you everything is an AEMT that you are allowed to do. And I would suggest that you go to this. There will be a link in the course room that will take you straight to this page so that you can review it. So the federal level, the federal level or the federal government has set out through the Department of Transportation and they have coordinated these new levels and they have coordinated a national scope of practice. It's a model that the states use as guidelines. However, the states do not have to accept them and the states do not have to abide by them, but they are there as a tool for the states to use. Now, we've talked about the state level, but what about the local level? Well, the local level, you have a medical director that is the person that grants us the authority to act in the field as a medical provider. We are an extension of his license or her license and we have to abide by their approved protocol. So protocols and skills and everything are approved by them. So even though your state says that as an advanced EMT you can give an IM injection, your local medical director may not authorize you to do it. And one thing that where it can get confusing is that your medical director at XYZ service may not allow you to use uh, that skill of administering an IM injection. However, the medical director at, at OPQRST medical transportation service may allow you to do it. So you have to make sure you know what you're allowed and what you're not allowed to do. So getting into specific things about our levels, well we don't think about it but the public is the first level, the first chain or anything for survival. And millions of people are trained every year in BLS and CPR. A lot of workplaces require it. You're talking about child care services like daycare, after school programs, uh, football coaches, baseball coaches, recreation departments, high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, and so on. Caretakers, security personnel, all these individuals are components of our EMS system. 
and they begin life-saving care. If you have a patient who's bleeding severely, well, you would want someone trained in first aid to be there to put direct pressure on it until a until an ambulance or a fire truck or someone got there that could continue on. AEDs. AEDs have contributed greatly to survival of those who have gone into cardiac arrest in the pre-hospital setting. The great thing about an AED is that untrained people can use it and we have been training people for many years in how to utilize an AED especially the public personnel who are usually right there and really quick to get on scene and make a difference. So the emergency medical responder, we used to call these first responders and now they are EMRs and they're in EMS because we need someone who is first on scene and can administer a higher level of care versus someone who just knows basic CPR and first aid. And a lot of these personnel that we know that participate in becoming EMRs involve firefighters, park rangers, ski patrols, law enforcement officers, you have lifeguards that also do it, security personnel, hazardous material technicians, and so on that will become EMRs. And there's a lot of industries out there that utilize EMRs as their workplace safety personnel as well. So they're trained to start immediate care and they're also trained to assist more advanced care providers once they get there. So they are a very valuable asset that we can depend on and that we need to respect and we need to make sure that they feel welcome when they're there to help us and that we really appreciate them. So also you have Good Samaritans and Good Samaritans are just the lay people who do not have to stop. They have no responsibility to stop and help at all but they do and they can provide us a lot of assistance especially if you were first on scene, and I know personally I've had to use civilians before. I've had patients that were in cardiac arrest, and it was just me and my partner, and they were doing CPR, and I just had them continue doing CPR while we were getting the defibrillator out, while we were getting things set up, and then when the fire department got there, we relieved them. But they were excellent at what they did, and they were a really big help. Even though I know it was hard on them, but we couldn't have got things done without them. So, One thing you have to be careful with though in using them is that they are not trained in rescue operations and they will not know when things is safe or not safe like your firemen or your police officers will because this, you got to remember, this is the first time possibly, possibly, this is their first time of ever being in a situation like this. So we want to keep that in our mind because at that point their safety becomes kind of our responsibility as well to look after them. For instance, they're not used to sharps or IV needles. So when you start an IV and if you drop the sharp on the floor and you say sharps on the floor, that alerts everybody, hey, there's a needle on the floor, be careful. But that lay person, they may not understand that and they may end up getting stuck. So we want to make sure that we keep their best interest in mind as well and keep them safe. So emergency medical technicians at their next step, they're uh, what you are right now. You're an EMT. The course required about 150 hours, more in some states. Some states it's less. And as an EMT, you're able to perform an a more advanced assessment. You're able to use oral and nasal adjuncts. You're able to assist more in advanced care. You're able to help patients with medications and you're able to operate the ambulance. You're able to do and understand a lot more what's going on, especially when it comes to scene safety and performing the basics. Because remember, the EMT level, that is the foundation for all of us. Without that foundation, we will not, we cannot be advanced level providers. 
So the advanced EMT, that's what you're here for right now. And the AMT course provides knowledge and skills and specific aspects of limited advanced care. For instance, you'll become you'll you'll learn how to administer medications through IM, through sub Q, and also through IV. You'll also learn how to insert advanced airway devices that are not intended to go into the trachea, but they're still advanced airway devices and they're very beneficial and very effective. So so pretty much what you're doing and what we do here in Georgia is that you're building on the EMT training level. You are expanding your scope and it is, it's a big difference, but it's not that big. So if you have any nerves about going forward about what we're going to be doing, please don't. Uh, we will get you through it and I, I assure you, you will enjoy it greatly. So the next, oh, one thing, I want to go back. In a lot of places, too, if you can see here, it says entry level. In some states, this is the entry level position to get into EMS. You do now have to do it as a stepping stone. You have to take EMT, then you have to take AEMT, and then you have to take paramedic. You can't skip anymore. So you have to go through all the steps. And last but not least is the paramedic. This is an extensive course of training. Anywhere from 800 to 1,500 hours or more. Here in Georgia, we are in the thousands plus hours of training. And most of the time, you're going to get this at your more uh, established colleges, your technical schools. There are some, uh, at some facilities out there that are teaching paramedic, like Grady Hospital is about to uh, become accredited. Gwinnett Fire Department is accredited to offer paramedic. And the important thing is, is that when you take this program from an accredited institution, it applies towards a degree. So getting that degree as a paramedic is very important. It's going to progress our profession as we look forward. So, and the paramedics, they practice under a wide range of ALS skills. So there's a lot of things that they can do. And there's a lot of leniency or leadway there where the medical director has a lot of say-so in what a paramedic can do in the field. Well, that concludes our lecture here on the different training levels. Please, if you have any questions or concerns, please make sure you get in touch with me. You can shoot me an email or text. And thank you for taking time and listening.